City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. This is the communications room where police, fire, ambulance, and dispatchers all come together. The ultimate team up, the Avengers for getting information and fighting crime. That's us. We break that down here. It's heartbreaking and sad every single week. We say we think about the families, but also we laugh a lot. Drew Breezy, how are you? You son of a bitch. You look great. You got a haircut. How are you? <laughs> I think I feel great. Uh, I'm still, uh, still believe it or not, recovering from uh, whatever the mung was that we had in... Uh, I say that every week. I'm going to say that every week until I feel 100% perfect. Yeah. Did uh, you uh, get that amoxicillin I sent you? I know that it's for fish, but the doctor says that it should work on you, and uh, we didn't have to get a prescription this way. So It's not horse. Uh, horse. It's not equine, is it? Well, the horse stuff was, uh, it turns out, I found out too late that that wasn't a pill. Anyway, I don't want you to have that. Uh, Drew, what's the case for breaking down tonight? Uh, by the way, we did have a discussion, John and I, off the camera last week of whether it was champing at the bit or chomping at the bit. Discuss. Tonight, we're going to talk about it's champing. Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, a North Ogden, Utah case. It's a very bizarre case where a, a guy traveled uh, close to uh, 700 miles from his home in, uh, I believe it was Long Beach, California, all the way to uh, North Ogden, Utah. Knocked on his brother's door. If you haven't seen this video, uh, the ring video of what happens, it is compelling. It's quite shocking, uh, but it's just an odd story. And um, it's got all the elements that uh, the comm center likes to break down. I mean, it's got a 911 call involved from the neighbor. It's got uh, footage from the ring doorbell. Uh, we have a victim known as Scott Roberts and his wife, Jody Roberts. We have a suspect named Jeffrey Roberts, who is about 66 years old. Uh, you'll see what we mean. It's a, uh, it's a very bizarre case. Um, you know what I want to talk about right now? Uh, I talked about the prosecutor from St. Louis who was, um, uh, resigned. She resigned because her office is in shambles because she's continually putting, uh, allegedly continually putting her ego before criminal cases and, and whatnot. Um, so, St. Louis in general is in shambles. And then I came across this uh, article out of nowhere, and it's, it's just started talking about how um, the 911 center the other night was uh, overwhelmed with calls and calls for service. Um, there was an avalanche of calls. It says 639 calls for service citywide in 12 hours from 3 p.m. Saturday to 3 a.m. Sunday. 173 calls were in District 4, which includes the downtown, and 55 of those were pending at the same time. So when you all, you know, all you cops out there or dispatchers even, when you get a little antsy because you're, you're holding calls, uh, just imagine a, a couple of screens worth 55 to be exact. But let's listen uh, into the news report of what exactly happened. There to be assault style rifles this morning in downtown St. Louis. This after nearly 20 people were shot with five killed over the weekend. Fox News Andy Banker reports police were so overwhelmed with calls they couldn't answer them all. So when you go on a Gateway Arch Riverboat cruise, this is where you park right along the Mississippi River. Well, things were so chaotic down here Saturday night that when people were done with their cruise, they stayed on the boat. They were afraid to get off and go back to their cars. Police admit they could not respond right away because of the avalanche of calls. 639 citywide over a 12-hour period Saturday and Sunday. 173 just in District 4, which includes downtown, 55 calls at the same time. Even though we were not able to respond at the immediate time, we responded and cleared those uh, people out that area. Police could not say how long people were actually stuck on the boat. By State Development, which operates the cruises, released a statement saying, starting this Thursday, we will be operating the gating system on the riverfront in order to limit levy access to employees and customers with cruise reservations only. This is new video of heavily armed young people leaving a downtown loft Monday morning. 
St. Louis Congresswoman Cori Bush called out state legislators for Missouri's lax gun laws, allowing all ages to open carry virtually any kind of firearm. The answer is not always throwing more police. The answer is making sure that, first of all, we don't have these loopholes for people to be able to access guns who should not be able to access guns. Longtime downtown resident Les Sturman of the group Citizens for a Greater Downtown St. Louis says the problem goes beyond gun laws. Why are these people that are carrying these weapons coming downtown? Why do they feel the need to have these weapons? Well, it's because there are certain venues, uh, there are certain uh, events that are attracting them. He's calling on the mayor and aldermen to do something about downtown landlords allowing unsupervised parties in their buildings. Andy Banker, Fox 2 News. So uh, think about that. Uh, Corey Bush, uh, who is, by the way, defund the police, defund the police, uh, but has uh, multi, uh, uh, multi hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, security armed staff, security guards, armed yeah. security. Um, and, and again, it's a very Kim Gardner esque response by, by her. Like, we can't just throw more police at it because she's already committed to the def defund the police stance. Um, just like Kim Gardner, who is uh, let, let's let, let's take a stroll down uh, Google Lane here. Uh, if you Google the words "St. Louis prosecutor resigns," the first uh, hit you're going to get is uh, embattled St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner, the city's first black prosecutor and a Democrat, announced Thursday that she will resign. Uh, that's from the AP News. The New York Times embattled St. Louis prosecutor to resign amid effort. Uh, but the the headline or, or the the sub headline of that article from the New York Times is Missouri's Republican Attorney General had asked a judge to uh, to remove her, uh, so they made it political. St. Louis prosecutor uh, Kim Gardner to resign June first. That was in St. Louis Post Dispatch. It seemed that that was just telling the story, and then the New York Post says Soros backed prosecutor Kimberly Garden resigns from St. Louis. So. Yeah, this is all political, but it's all about sticking to your, um, you know, your. It's all about their woke policies, John. I know that you've said this in the past on a on a previous rant. Uh, they're empty, soulless people, and uh, they fill it with uh, woke policy. And um, you know, if if I were to go on a drunken rant, that would be the exact same thing I would say. I'm and, surprised uh, you remember that thing that didn't happen. Although, you know what's. <laughs> You know, what's fake news anymore? Who knows what actually happened? Uh, no, it's just ridiculous that she has problems with people who are peacefully open carrying when we all know the, pro the, the people that are abiding by the laws aren't the ones you need to worry about. And you know, it's just so intellectually dishonest. We need to get rid of all these guns. Well, the only I, this is so obvious, but it just this is the argument. If you pass a law that restricts guns, only the people who care about that restriction are going to care, which. I've been arguing with people all week down in Texas. I get on Instagram sometimes in a fight with people who say, well, we need to ban these guns. We need stricter gun control laws. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to take an even bigger stance than I've ever taken before in failure to stop. We not only need to ban all of these guns, we need to ban murder. Banning guns is not enough. You can make guns illegal and people will still get guns and kill people. But until we make murder illegal, it will not stop. Drew, back to you. I, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to just rip a page right out of the Biden administration playbook. And uh, because I agree with them, they made uh, lynching illegal. Uh, that was one of the first things they did. It and, was uh, nice because, because I mean, that's been legal this entire time. You yeah, murder but, uh, someone by lynching them. Had Thank no God idea. they got rid of that. Had no idea, but they, they definitely stomped out that problem. So the, the lynching stats should go way down. Um, so this is this is what I'm saying. This is these are big societal problems that that lead to uh, even bigger problems. Think about this. Um, you got the 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 elected representative yelling defund the police. You've got the the prosecutor who's falling down on the job. She's attending nursing school, not paying attention. She's asleep at the wheel. One and two, she's letting people out that shouldn't be let out. So now that what that does is it empowers the criminal. The criminals now carry open carry downtown AR rifles and all the all the evil, you know, rifles that uh that that those kinds of lawmakers uh detest and then they want to blame Republicans and their stupid guns and blah blah blah. And I you know, I don't I don't care about 
Republican and Democrat at this point. I care about citizen safety, and I've been saying this from the mountaintops for years. When you start this movement where you where you piss the cops off, basically, where you shame them, where you drive them out of the profession, we will be a less safe society. So go ahead and we're, keep committing to your. We're already that, there. Let's, we're already let, there. I mean, let's not yeah, forget Memphis. We had five police officers taking police action, and they were all hired since 2020. So think about the five vacancies that came about in 2020 from smart, intelligent, caring police officers who said, "F this noise, I'm going home." And we hired some, you know, possibly gang members to replace them. So society, you're getting what you wanted. You wanted, you wanted the police gone. You wanted the defunded. Well, they retired and they got out of here. But guess what? We still have some vacancies. So I guess you're going to get what you're going to get. And all your training is gone. All your training is gone way downhill. Your standards are way downhill. No one wants to be a police officer. So if you walk in the door and you have a pulse and you don't stab yourself when you put on the badge, you're pretty much good to go. <laughs> well, even if you do. But but there's a um, – so now what what that is leading to is the lawlessness there in St. Louis. Uh, but again – when you when you undermine police authority and you drive the good ones out of the profession, especially like quality leadership, vigilantism is going to go through the roof. So you you're getting everything you ask for, AOC. You're getting everything you ask for, Cory Bush, uh, Ilhan, Hom- uh, Ilhan Omar, all you guys. You're you're, you're all what, what's the other Rashida Tlaib and uh, the other one that Ayanna Presley. You're getting everything you wanted. This is everything you wanted, Gavin Newsom, who who very boldly uh, wants to take on the Second Amendment as if he is uh, he, he's much better than the framers of any constitution. Um, You're being ironic, Drew, but I mean, this actually is the plan. I mean, if you want to transform America, if you want to take over a country, you know, the Second Amendment's the thing that you have to do away with, first of all. But you also need to do away with a police department that has a conscience and is going to right. hold, hold their oath to the Constitution and not toe the line of their leaders. So if you want to fundamentally transport, transform this country, number one, you're going to have to get rid of guns like, you know, Germany did and Russia and Australia (laughs) and even England. And then so, and then you're going to have to have police departments that uh, don't really care about the constitution. They care about doing the political thing. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not something that I think can happen in this generation, but maybe next generation. And that's what we need to worry about. Go ahead. So how does that affect people in a communication center? Well, society becomes more violent and the more violent society becomes the more trauma you're going to face over the phone the more trauma you face over the phone the less there will be of you retained in the profession and the less there are of you retained in the profession the more the stress is going to be put on you the individual so uh it does have bigger broader implications like it it does and i appreciate that you've made it about me i mean that doesn't normally happen although it always should De- de-arming the, the populace of the United States and using federal grants to assume control of police departments is bad news for me personally. Drew? Uh, the, com- the, the communications area is uh, written in the 11th commandment. I just don't remember what the commandment is. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, maybe you will later, we're, we're going to talk about uh, this, um, this Ogden, this North Ogden case, and at the end of the the kind of the standoff, it was discovered there's a rather large fire. And who else would we want to bring into our fold, John? Probably no one, since a firefighter will destroy the show. Drew, go ahead. <laughs> so staged down the road, we are now going to tell him the screen is safe to deploy into. It's Chief Keith. <laughs> yes. It's uh, Jason Keeper from <laughs> One More and I'm Out of Here podcast. Jason, welcome aboard. He is in uh, Anderson Township, which is just outside of Cincinnati. I believe he, he, the, the backdrop looks like he's at the Varsity Sports Bar. It may or may not be. You might you might have been a police detective in, in your former I life. Was. If, <laughs> you, uh, if you don't know, Jason, uh, he uh, hosts and uh, is, does most of the important work over on a, a podcast called One More and I'm Out of Here, which is all about uh, all kinds of things, but especially Cincinnati. And he's been a a longtime friend of the show since before I even got here, and he's always been cool to me. So sorry about all the firefighter shit. It's just, <laughs> you know, people were upset that you were on tonight, and I have to kind of, you know, talk to them. So how are I you would, doing, I would, Jason? I would expect nothing less, and ha- great to be are, with you guys. Yeah, have you ha- had anything cool lately? Anything burned down on you? You had a patient die in your arms as you reached into the abyss trying to drag him back <laughs> to life? Anything cool? 
Uh, well, I worked uh, Tuesday and we had a fire at like 4 a.m. And I was up for like 36 hours after that, just doing normal stuff after I got off work. But I'm calling you work, after the show. I have a story to tell you about Tuesday. I'm going to call you later. Go ahead. Where, where I work, it, it, we're not super, super busy anymore. So that's good. But uh, we're, we're holding it down as best we can. I appreciate the uh, the offer to come on. So thank you. Yeah, was John? Is your your personal story with him? I'm not going to try to put you on the spot. But did it have anything to do with setting a fire in Anderson Township? La, 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 la. Uh, no, uh, it's. Um, <laughs> I'm better not say anything about no, it. No, don't say. It. <laughs> well, let's wait don't till the, the case is closed. <laughs> All right, and, and please don't bring the bones home. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, kind of delve into the the case tonight. I'm trying my best. Th- there are some graphic uh, scenes in this case. Uh, we can't avoid it. We're going to do our best to kind of uh, self-censor a little bit to make sure it gets past uh, the YouTube <clears throat> censors. But if you're listening to this, we'll do our best to narrate what's going on here. But let's just start off with uh, the shocking uh, video camera. Uh, I, I'm sorry, the ring um, surveillance camera on, on the ring doorbell. So you can see an older gentleman walking up to the door. He he rings the doorbell. He's wearing his uh, hoodie. Little did anybody know, he had driven from Long Beach, California, to North Ogden, Utah. It's a 700-plus mile drive. It's around, I don't know, 10 to 12 hours. So, soon after, his uh, brother answers the door, opens the door. And you can see the conversation that takes place um, momentarily. Hey, what's up? What are you doing? Don't the case. We came by the same mom. She's not here. Where's she at? In Missouri. Okay, so if you haven't caught that, there's a dog barking in the background. But he says, well, I I came here to see Ma. And uh, the brother on the inside of the house says, the the brother is uh, the victim. His name is Scott Roberts. uh, Spoiler alert, victim. He says, uh, she's not here. He says, well, where is she? Well, she's in Missouri. We'll pick up up the conversation from there. What is she doing there? Well, she's living with Lorinda's mom, who's taking care of her. Really? Well, how long has she been there? Uh, About a year. All right, you can see it's a very calm conversation, and what you can't see on the podcast is... uh, Jeffrey Roberts, the elder guy that's on the ring doorbell camera, has backed up just a little bit, and he's moved his right arm into his chest area. Uh, it's whatever's, it's all being hidden by his hoodie. Really? So what I suspect happened was he was wearing a shoulder holster. He took a handgun out of that um uh, out of that holster he went to charge it the firearm discharged so you'll you hear one shot but you also see him advancing into the house and then you'll hear some uh subsequent gunshot Nine one one. what's the address all right, I'm not going to play the 911 call yet. I do want to replay this in real time for you, though. Man just so you get how, just... He's breathing heavy already. He's got his left hand kind of tucked into his pocket there, like he's trying to hold his... If he's got heavy weight in the left side of his hoodie, he's kind of trying to make it keep it from swaying about as he walks or trying to hold it close to his body. He's checking the gun now before the yeah, door's adjust, open. Adjust it or whatever. Just like a shoplifter would, uh, you know, check something in his pocket before he leaves. He's checking that item. You notice he doesn't get invited hey, in by his up? brother. What are you doing? Don't the case. We came by the same mom. She's not here. Where's she at? In Missouri. What is she doing there? Well, she's living with Lorinda's mom, who's taking care of her. Really? Yeah. Well, how long has she been there? Uh, about, about a year. Really? 911, what's the address? Okay, 
uh, discussion points, uh, John? Well, just it's first of all, it's harrowing to hear uh, what is most certainly Mortal Kombat inside that house. We have uh, two brothers who are going after each other. One's armed, and uh, there, there's. Uh, it's not just these two people involved. Obviously, this is a crowded neighborhood. This is, you know, it's uh, sunny outside. And there's presumably other people around. This was only weeks ago, uh, so this is a fairly recent case. But uh, you know, something's wrong there. He shows up. He's asking about mom. It's obviously a pretense to something else. She's not there. She's been in Missouri for a year, so there's no reason to believe that she would actually be there. Uh, Jason, what do you got? So, I mean, it was it was funny because I read some of the the transcripts, you know, before this, and I don't know who I heard Lorinda. I'm not sure who Lorinda is, because um, that's not that's not the brother's wife's name, correct? No, Jody is the brother's wife's name, unless right. uh, unless they call her Lorinda. I don't know. So I don't know who Lorinda is, but but I'm wondering if you know if they're obviously there's some mental issues, but if they're they're estranged, so he has no idea where his mother is actively residing but then like watching him pull his gun out it's you know it's almost like a leg shot to knock him down and then obviously you, you hear more but it was it was interesting just watching as john said as he's walking up to the door he's already heavy breathing his, his adrenaline's already going because he knows what he's going to do and it, it, that part was interesting to me though like i, I want to know more backstory on his mental capacities you know does he have any uh, documented medical records of, you know, mental, mental illness or, or whatever. But I almost want to hold off on playing the mental illness card because it's like, you know, we, that's such a, an issue that we face every week on this show. And in so many police issues, right. Or so many issues that you see in society and on this show, I would say let's withhold the mental health card until we see something that really shows that because I mean, sure. if sane, sane people go after each other and let's face it, brothers, brothers have been fighting <laughs> since uh, the first murder. True. It's uh, I, it, the only reason I toss that was the, the fact that he didn't know where his mother was. So it's uh, that's that's the only reason I toss that it, in there. But. Yeah, I I see what you're saying. If he be, if he really is confused about it, but I think it's just a pretext to have him open the door sure. and talk to him, and maybe maybe he you know he doesn't quite have the nerve right as the door opens to just start blasting. So maybe <laughs> right. he's talking. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I I just wonder where the the line is. Like I, I, my thought or theory is that just about everybody that commits murder has some kind of mental health issue i mean if, if yeah, you're yeah. willing to take somebody else's life so but you know where is the where is the line now it's it would seem to me that it would be hard to argue that this was a crime of passion because he had to drive for 10 to 12 hours no so, no this is this is premeditated this is first degree definitely yeah this is flat out like he made him he made a decision like he saw a f <laughs> i'm speculating but he saw a post on facebook and something clicked <laughs> and he's like i'm going to go take care of this mf right now and he got in his car i, I don't know if he wore a diaper like that crazy astronaut, astronaut. Yeah. yeah but <laughs> uh and drove 11 hours and uh you're right i mean he, he knew what he was going to do uh walking up i i wonder and I, I would like to know more backstory because I do wonder, uh, just because I'm curious, I mean, you know, we're all nosy at this point, but uh, I wonder if he, if he was asking where his mom was um, because he wanted to see her because he wanted to take, take her out. Get her out of the or, house. That's a good point. Absolutely. Or, or yeah. either get her out of the house or kill her, one, or, oh, yeah. or was his... Uh, his mind made up that if he tells me anything but yes, come in and see mom, I'm going to kill him. Yeah, it's ha it's happened. <laughs> it's go time. It's, it's it's going down. I mean, you're right. He walked up and he was already um, <laughs> he was already short of breath when he was walking up before he even rang the doorbell. Uh, it gets even worse. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what happens from here. Now, um, what we're going to play is the neighbor's 911 call. So we'll talk a little bit about that after. The 911 call, please. The city of your emergency. What city? North Ogden. And one more time with that address. Tell me what's happening. Um, it was next door, and it sounded like gunshots, but I'm not sure about that. But no, it's okay. Uh, what? Was... Sorry, what but I don't direction know. Direction from you. It was just. Um, it would be west of me the next house to me i think how many did you hear 
Mm-hmm. Several. There is a note on the screen uh, that is identifying the fact that they edited this 911 call very heavily to keep the person's name out of it. <clears throat> but Did you hear anything before or after? No. And there was a guy that walked out of the house, but I couldn't tell. Like I said, it was pretty loud, but you know, it sounded... Was, male, was it a male or...? A male in a brown van. Let me see. Went to a brown van. Did he leave in the van or? No, he's still there, but it must not be. I don't know if it was gunshots, maybe. That's okay. We can always check the area just to make sure. Do you live in a house or an apartment? I live in a house. Uh, what's your name for just for our records? Okay. Do you know if that male lives there or? No. No, I've I've never seen the van, but it looks like it's a work van, so I don't know. That's what I'm saying now. I'm questioning myself, but it sounded like gunshot. But anyway, if they could gotcha. at least come uh, to check you out. description on that mail? Did you see any weapons on him at all? I didn't. I mean, he was the carrying something. He's right. Huh? Are you aware of just any drugs or alcohol with him, just for officer safety? No. No. Do you have any description of him, like rough age, race, anything like that? He looks like he's in his maybe late 50s. Okay, so I'm going to pause it there. John, uh, there was something that really struck me about this, uh, being a former dispatcher, that I was like, okay, now I know for sure it's gunshots. Uh, I want to see if you picked up on something similar, but go ahead. What do you? Well, now, now you put me on the spot, and now all my brain's <laughs> deleted. So yeah, I'll you're just, never gonna, just you're never going to be good enough. So I don't know, and you know, I've I've only dispatched for eight years, and you only did it for eight minutes until you could finally become a cop <laughs> and achieve your dreams. But yeah. Um. So my my first thought is, you know, looking at the at the video, you know, this is obviously this is this something the dispatcher doesn't have, but looking at these uh really nice pillars in this nice house and this nice neighborhood. You can just tell it's a nice place, but um, the caller next door says, it sounds like gunshots, but I'm not sure. That's how you know it's a nice neighborhood. The guy does, he's not accustomed to hearing gunshots or fireworks even because right. so often as a 911 dispatcher, you'll get, you'll get complaints about fireworks pretty much the entire month around July 4th, you know, June, you know, 4th to like August 4th, you're getting fireworks calls. Now I've no been around guns my whole life. I know this is a gun. That is a, that is the sound of a, of a rifle being fired. And it's just like, it fizzles at the end. So it's like, it's obviously not gunshots. So, but this guy, you know, he's not sure if it's gunshots or not. So that says something about the peace of the neighborhood. Um, he is kind of keeping an eye on things. If, you know, he's looking outside and seeing what's going on. The dispatcher asks a couple good questions. Like some of them would seem to be nonsensical. Like, you know, did you see him carrying a weapon or do you have a description of the person or whatever? And it's just like, well, we don't, you know, we don't know if the guy was looking at this person who arrived at the house beforehand or not. If he was outside, maybe observed him or whatever. Um, He knows that the van doesn't belong there. The guy doesn't live there. It's a work van. He's actually a pretty good caller and he has a good description of the guy. Um, But, uh, you know, he, he's very scared. He's very shaken. Uh, you can tell. And I, I think I, my impression of him, and this is just mine, is that uh, he, he's scared shitless and he doesn't want to show it. And he doesn't want to seem like he's overreacting because he's just like, seems like it could have been, you know, a hail of gunfire. I don't know. But if you maybe want to send somebody by, that's probably a good idea. You know, he, yeah. he seems like he's kind of uh, his reactions couched there a little bit. But I, I think he's genuinely afraid. Uh, uh, so what did G- I miss, Drew? Chief, before I go to you, Chief Keefe, a uh, couple things. First of all, I am so proud of you, John. That's exactly what I was thinking. That is my exact frame of mind. Uh, in my years, uh, everybody knows what gunshots sound like, except for people who hear actual gunshots. Because they're like, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm second guessing myself now. And and that that generally to me means those are gunshots. He doesn't want it uh, to be gunshots, that's because, for sure. Right, because they don't want to believe what their ears just told them. Secondly, B. Trav, uh, one of our mainstays here, one of our former 
chronic callers who I uh, adore, a fellow Sting fan, asks, uh, which agency is uh, this 911 call going to? Uh, he, the reason he asks is his brother works for Weber County, and it kind of sounds like him. Well, here's the deal. Uh, now that we're talking about siblings all night, this is the brother show. Uh, this uh, 911 recording was released by the Weber County attorney's office. So it could very well be your your brother. Oh, very small world. Uh, yeah. I, I've run into very, this very. like three or four times in doing this show. This is uh, this is a very cool thing. So this, this may very well be one of our uh, – Long time listener, several time caller, uh, brothers, uh, brother, uh, who took that phone call. Um, now, then the other thing is, uh, you're right, you're absolutely right. He's, uh, he's like, Look, you want to send somebody, uh, I'd appreciate it if you could swing by. I mean, sounds kind of weird, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, w- when things are like that, it's just like, Oh, shit. And I commend the dispatcher and Brian, if this is your brother, tell him so. Uh, Complete calm, gather all the information, put the information in, let the deputy sheriff go out there and, and, and handle business. Like a- Absolutely solid, and he could tell the guy was scared, and he didn't get him amped up at all. He didn't just be like, it's probably gunfire, and we're going to send out a SWAT team. He's just like, yeah, don't worry about it. If you don't know if it was or wasn't, we're going to check it out all the same. We're going to make sure the area is safe, you know? Just kind of, you know, he could tell the guy was scared, and he just kept it on an even keel. Very excellent dispatcher, and if he is your brother, you tell him good job. Tell him great job, and uh, I, I will um, uh, defer over to Chief Keith. What do you got? What do you see in this, or what do you hear in this? So, so here, and, and I, I'm going to mimic. I mean, staying calm. I mean, he almost sounded sounded like you know just a radio DJ doing his thing, right? You know, just normal stuff. But collecting that information and grabbing as much information as he could you know, to throw in, and I don't know this area at all, but you know, whether they have MDCs, you know, computers, the more notes you get as you're on the way, the better, you know, Brown van. All right. Brown van in a driveway. I've never seen it. This and that. Um, I think he did a great job watch, you know, so, just watching that part, that portion of the video and, and listening to that. I mean, you really can't, you can't give any more than that. And Jason, so you're, you're going into danger a lot of the time. You're dispatched out there like, you know, what what does it mean for you, someone going into a hazardous situation and you're the person who's sending you there is calm, cool and collected versus maybe a little nervous? If you have experience with a nervous dispatcher versus a, a cool one, like what effect does that have on you as, you, you know, your adrenaline's pumping and you're heading into a situation? Go ahead. And I think we've talked about it a little bit, uh, whether I, you know, when I've called in or whatever, but. Yeah, we have an automated dispatch initially. So it's it's a robotic voice, you know, just this is what you're going for, fire alarm. If it comes out structure fire, obviously you're already keyed up. But as you're going, you're getting updates on a computer, but then the dispatcher is also relaying voice. You know your seasoned dispatchers because they're like, uh, you know, engine whatever. Uh, you've got smoke showing per PD out of the front of the window versus uh, – a newer dispatcher, you've got smoke showing, you know, and as soon as they get amped up, you're like, Oh shit. Okay. Like, you know, you have those seasoned dispatcher and and some of the newer dispatchers are great at it and they can can compartmentalize it because they know we need anything that the, because a PD typically gets there before we do, because they're out on the road, right? They're, they're doing their feet. So they're, they're great at relaying information to dispatch and it shoots it to us, but it's, you know, that calm, cool. I'm like, okay, I got, I got smoke. Cause I'm already amped up getting my air pack on, you know, doing other things, you know, to prepare to, you know, deploy hose lines or whatever, you know, whatever we're going to do. But it's that, that, that calm demeanor means, I mean, it means world. Yeah. Drew, go ahead. It does. Uh, well, I, I just, I, I'm stuck on uh, Micah's comment. Micah is the MVP of, of chats. He's uh, actually, he's the uh, president in charge of chats. And he uh, established that he he what he needs you to do is hit the like button like it's your brother. Uh, and I think that that is the most poignant uh, chat I have ever heard. You and, know, Mike, the people, Mike is people, really good at puns, I've noticed. And, he's uh, good. He's, uh, he, and we're so proud of Micah for uh, he, he not only took out the um, Scorpion gang, he took down the brown recluses. Uh, on a on a watch. On yes, a Micah watch. Okay. killed a man last week. That's what we're saying on this show. 
<laughs> All right. So uh, we'll we'll continue on with what we got. I mean, uh, this is uh, obviously tragic for the, the the family that you know this happened to. Uh, we throw in we inject a little humor because that's how we deal with our stresses. Sometimes uh, we're not making uh, poking fun at any of the the victims in this whole thing, but. Um, we're going to continue on here. This is where it gets uh, kind of uh, graphic. You'll see that the guy runs out of the house, um, and, and I'm just going to let it play from there because uh, at some point a body camera is going to kick in. So he's already shot his brother. He's shot. He shot his brother's wife. I want to know what he dropped. Uh, he dropped a magazine. He dropped a. Was, uh, I, I yeah. can't see it from here, but yeah. You, uh, you, the firefighters might call it a clip, but he dropped a magazine from that gun, and he, uh, uh, he's walking out to his car to get whatever, and we'll see what it is in a second. Um, this is best viewed. And, and by the way, hold on a second. Let me let me explain something. I pulled this from police activity once again because they seem to be the the source of a lot of our uh, stuff. Um, but if you look in the lower right corner beside or underneath the police activity watermark, you will see, uh, the time on the ring doorbell. So this is edited as well. There, there is like a minute or two that elapsed, like when he leaves the residence and he comes back in with this bag. So, uh, take a look at what is in his right hand. We'll narrate for the podcast set. He's holding a shotgun and that's him. That's him, heavy breathing, and he's walking back in. The wife, uh, the wife of the guy survived. I don't. I think she may have escaped at this point. Genghis, my turn. You can never know. A lot of confusion, smoke alarms going off, and for good reason. We'll get into that in a second. Okay, so what it says here is uh, he, he's. We were trying to determine what he actually said before the show. Uh, we played it over and over again. Uh, he, he's saying something similar to, "Get in my garage." He's on the phone with somebody. He says, "Grab, get in the garage, grab my crickets and turtles." We, and we're not joking when we say this. I think this is actually what he's saying. And that. he said, uh, and empty my bank accounts as quick as you can, which is a very ominous. Now, um, Drew, what does this, what does this say to you as, as a detective? Because we know this is premeditated. He loaded, he loaded up, drove 700 miles to get here, but all of his, uh, his plans that needs to go, needs to happen. He didn't do that beforehand. He didn't drive up and say, empty out the bank account. Grab the snapping turtle, grab the crickets, and get the hell out of Dodge. Was it that maybe he really didn't think that he was going to go through with this, or like maybe the mother was part of the condition of of his lethal assault? Because why would he wait until afterwards when the alarms are blaring to think, "Oh, I need to get all the my the money out of my account." Go ahead. Yeah, I, I I think that this was conditional. I think I think it was conditional, as in, um, if she's not there, then you know, it, it like. It's hard to prosecute uh, a conditional like murder for hire. Like, you know, if if he testifies against me, I'm going to I want you to go kill him. You're probably not going to get a conviction on that because there's a condition that's that's placed in there. There's an out. In other words, in this case, he carried it through that that was his condition. His condition was if if brother A says X, Y, Z, then I'm going to shoot him. Uh, And so when that happened plan went into action this is like instantaneous giving away your belongings getting your affairs in order because you know what's coming next and if you you know you can't see the people that are seeing the video can see this it says uh it, there's a red circle around the left pillar of the house of the of the front porch and it says bullet holes from jeffrey uh, from where jeffrey fired at police there's a p- patrol car uh, like an explorer that's pulling up at the moment and you could see very obvious bullet holes so what happened was when the first patrol car arrived he started shooting immediately so this this turned into a possible suicide by cop maybe i hate using that term loosely but it looks sort of like what it is he wants to go down in a blaze of glory no pun intended um, and then we'll 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 discuss why uh, there's a pun in there. Uh, 
Keith, do you see anything, Chief? No, I, I don't. I don't see how my my personal opinion. I don't see how it's anything different than that. I mean, he loaded up, twelve hour drive. He's got a mini arsenal, and you'll you'll go into the stuff later. You know what happens, but yeah, I mean, I feel like he knew he wasn't coming out of there personally. Yeah, um, we, we do have confirmation that it is uh, Brian's, uh, B. Trav's uh, brother that was on the phone. I think we have confirmation of that. I, I certainly don't want to put him in the position of uh, sure. calling us. If anybody else wants to call us, you can do so at 848-COM-911. That's 848-266-6911. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, I, I really don't want him, uh, you know, just... Uh, no, put this, him on the, this put investigation him on the may be open. He doesn't want to reveal the, himself. He probably he probably doesn't even want to talk about it. To be honest, I wouldn't want to either. So, I mean, that's, yeah. that would that's cool. The idea that like we're basically you know one or two steps away from the person who's who we're covering on this call, right. but uh, leave him in peace. I, you know, I, I would say <laughs> plenty of other people have opinions. They can, I hope they call in and say and say things. But Drew, I, I agree with uh, your assessment there that uh, basically. You know, he was 99% and then, uh, and then he went ahead with it. And then that was when he had to put everything else in order. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not so. convinced that it was a, a suicide by cop thing. I think he might want to be going on the run, particularly if he's worried about money. Maybe, maybe he thinks he's going to get the hell out of Dodge. I'm not sure yet. Can, can, well, can, I, what, can I ask you real quick, John, like when you said, uh, worried about money, it, he's, he's telling somebody to empty his bank account and we don't know who yeah. he's, he's actually speaking to. So like that, that's the part that confuses me a ton is who knows you're gone 12 hours away that you had, that has access to your bank account. That, and, that's confusing. Yeah. Like you would think a spouse and then, you know, what, what's going through that person's mind when there's alarms and they're like, get all the money out of the bank. Like that, <laughs> that, person, would in the background. <laughs> that, that, that person would have to have foreknowledge of it too, to basically put the plan into action. Cause otherwise right. they're not going to do it. They're just going to, they're just going to be confused. Like, why would I do this? What's going on? And they won't, is your car, is your car broke out. down? No, yeah. there's fire alarm school. <laughs> but, but I, I guess, you know, my alternate theory, if we're going to present more than one is that he was going to get on the run, uh, that he wanted to, he, he thought that he killed both people inside. He's going to burn the house down maybe cause he thought that would destroy evidence, which is something that you'll talk about. And then uh, get the hell out of Dodge. And uh, the the thing about the money, when I first heard that, I thought maybe this whole thing was about money because brothers fight about that. So sure. yeah, uh, yeah. And and if mom's in Missouri, because I didn't hear and what was going on with moms. her. But if but if mom's maybe not in the right state of mind, maybe they're preparing to. You know, I mean, brothers certainly fight over inheritance and things like yeah, that. Yeah, that's so they, maybe they were fighting the about thing. that. Yeah, that, that's, go, that's that's. I don't want to spoil the about. show for for everyone with my thoughts. I'll I'll cut out. Drew, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're you're. Uh, I, I think you're on the right track. I mean, this could be over in an inheritance. Like you know, he's like, "Where's mom? I want to see mom." And if she's not there, that means she's dead, and you've already spent the money. And you, here you are in your nice house in Ogden. You didn't give me any of the money. All speculation. Uh, when he's saying, in my opinion, though, when he's saying, "Get the money out of my account," he doesn't want it tied up in in probate, or he doesn't want. Uh, anybody from this side of the family getting a hold of it to replace the people or, he killed. He or he doesn't it. want the police to freeze or seize his assets yeah, ways in flight. Exactly. But but just judging by his behavior and again, spoiler alert, when he walks out of this house, I, I, I tend to think that uh, I don't think he was going to get away on this one. Well, let's get to it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, so I did exactly what I said I wasn't going to do. Uh, <laughs> I, I really didn't want to play that. Uh, he, he came Spoiler the, alert. He came out of the house, guns a-blazing, uh, and you can barely see on the other end of it. Um, you know, you, you see faintly in the distance that officers, he's engaging officers in gunfire, and it's very clear that he had he's, already engaged them in gunfire because there, was, there were shots already, yeah. you know, bullet holes in the pillars. And uh, if we uh, here it is again, I wish this were blurred, but, but but he charges at him and they cut his strings. He went down like a puppet with the strings cut. I mean, in movies or whatever else you see, like a, a heroic person taking bullets and they're still standing and firing back. Maybe that can happen. This guy didn't do that. He got shot and no. he went down. No, he he went down and, and somebody does say uh, at some point, at some point, somebody does say uh, he took a headshot. So, uh, and they have this blurred here. You can see, I mean, you can see it's, a, it's obviously a guy that is injured, but, 
Uh, they have his head blurred. And everything else seems to be intact. Uh, and then you'll hear them communicating with one another. There's somebody else down in there. He looks dead. But here, let's listen to that. Who's that? It's fire. Three roll medical and send us some additional units, please. All right. So uh, for those watching and uh, for those who can't watch, if you st if you see this YouTube video, you'll see uh, right under where the guy where the officer's watch band is in this picture right now. There's a there's a set of windows. It's to the left of the front door. It would be like a den or something. You know, if you walked into there, uh, you could see actual flames in there and you'll start to see some thick black smoke. Those are the kinds of things I wanted to talk to Chief Keefe about. Yeah, we're going to ask about hey, black smoke. Here, three left, on the way, and we back hey, female says she will shop. <coughs> okay, where's she at? Go deal with her. Shotgun there. I'm going to pull out. Hold on, cover me, cover me. I'm putting on gloves. You got that weight. Yep. We, 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 like There's a fire inside the house. we got smoke pouring out. <laughs> Multiple alarms going off. Thick black smoke. Heavy thick black smoke. Okay, so let me ask you, Chief Keefe. Uh, it, it appears you, you got one guy tending to the victim, uh, who, what we'll call the victim, the aggressor. Uh, we, you got one guy attending to, attending to him to make sure he's dead so he's not going to reach for other weapons. He uh, The other officer instructs someone else to go deal with the girlfriend who escaped the house, or the wife, rather. Then you have the sergeant who was holding deadly force on uh, everybody, but he had a rifle. It sounds to me like he smashed the window where he saw the smoke that was coming out. Uh, good idea, bad idea? Um, depends. I mean, that that's an early stage fire, so bad idea to be honest with you because what you're doing is you're creating another flow path for that yeah. heat and fire um if you keep it contained as best as you can when you know when we arrive then everything's compartmentalized as soon as you bust a window i mean that front window probably it's probably not a huge deal i don't know the layout of that house but sure when you when you start busting windows and you create a different flow path, it's going to change where that where that heat and smoke fire, you know, and then you know the heat and the smoke are what ignite as as it's going through and igniting the combustibles. So you change that flow path. I mean, it could change a lot of things. Okay, so would it matter um, if if he used a, a certain type of accelerant? I mean, it's my understanding that he just lit a bunch of road flares. That's what he had in that bag. That's what he I lit read. A, br a bunch of road flares and probably threw them on the couch or whatever. You know, whatever. If he used like gas or if he used some kind of accelerant, does that does that affect anything other than the speed of which the fire would spread? De definitely, I mean, we would be looking at something completely different if he used accelerants. There'd be a, a ton more fire. You still have your black smoke, but him tossing, and I would guess, and as you, as we were watching it, because I haven't seen this part of the video, as we were watching it, I'm like, he probably threw it on a piece of furniture, or whatever, mm -hmm. because everything that we own is has petroleum in it. You know, all our couches, you know, all our all our furniture and stuff. So as soon as that that couch ignites, it's it's black smoke right away. Keith, Had it been that, an accelerant, you'd see more flames coming out that door, I promise. Keith, is that why, uh, you know, a lot of times when we're dispatching fire, the main thing that firefighters will want to know is the color of the smoke because it, it that reveals a lot about what's on fire and what stage the fire is at and even maybe the temperature of the fire. This is your this is your expert stuff. So go. Yeah. No, no, you're right. And uh, I mean, I'm sure you've li I mean, you've listened in on on fire runs, you know, structure fires and whatever. Um you know, ventilation is coordinated with fire attack. So, you know, we don't ventilate before the fire attack team's ready, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's a choreographed chaos dance, but with, you know, throwing accelerant into that and the, and the smoke. Yeah. If it's, if, if it's a hazy, light gray smoke, a dense, thick black smoke, uh, and I'll use an example. If you have a tire factory burning, it's going to be really dense, black, almost cloud-like, like bubbly, like what well, was it, cumulus clouds or whatever. It's going to be really super dense. Roiling out and instead of just kind of streaming upwards. Yeah, it doesn't, Correct. doesn't, that would not resemble, you know, steam at all, which this is, you know, this is kind of just venting straight up and out, but. Right. What you're talking about is almost like a billowing. Yeah. And and it's really thick and dense. So like, like, like I said, the furniture in our houses, in everyone's house, 
that's that's going to be black, but it may it may not be you know as dense until more things in that room start to catch as that temperature in that in that compartment you know increases. So n- now knowing, and then Drew, hold me up if we're skipping ahead. I just you know this is our chance no. to talk fire stuff. Uh, these road flares, you know, what kind of chemicals are in there, and what chemicals inside a road flare that causes that you know that ignition. What potential hazards are posed for you in terms of your normal firefighting? Because this is not the same thing as, you know, curtains catching on fire from an iron or, you know, right. a gasoline fire from a stove. If you knew going down there for sure that it was going to be road flares versus something else, what, how would that change your approach as a firefighter? Well, I mean, most, you know, most cops carry road flares. We carry road flares. And that's mostly phosphorus. Is right. it, you know, in in my experience, uh, they may have come out with some new stuff, but we have phosphorus flares. Um, they burn very, very hot, but typically it's a white smoke. So, him tossing that on the couch at that point, it really doesn't matter because now we're dealing with uh, the potential hydrogen cyanide with all of the the products of combustion. Uh, C, you know, CO w- w- would be later carbon monoxide, which is incomplete combustion. But I mean, right now, obviously, it's everything is is ro- starting to roll pretty good. So the uh, hydrogen cyanide, what kind of risk does that pose in terms of a breathing hazard to the officers who are already there and the and the victim that's still inside? So I mean, you figure looking at the video right now, and I know the podcast listeners can't see it, but nobody's made entry yet. You start going in there. I mean, you've got maybe a minute or two before that hydrogen cyanide starts, but we're early into this. So I don't think there's a whole bunch of hydrogen cyanide built up yet. Yeah, but I think yeah. there's there's even a supervisor I think that says, "Nay, hey, yeah, we're not going in there with that smoke." Right. See, and that's a good that's a good police supervisor. Um, well, here's here, here's something that I, I wish you would talk a little bit more about. Okay. Um, because the because I guarantee you, cops in general and probably our civilian friends don't don't understand or don't know this the carcinogens in a in today's couch or if you use some kind of fabric guard or even in a car like if is that not the one of the more um significant dangers for a firefighter it's not necessarily the roof collapsing on your head it's breathing in the toxins from everyday stuff yeah and that's yeah, and that's and that's something that our industry has gotten much better about. To where when I first started, as soon as the fire was out, but there's still lingering smoke, we take our air masks off, you know, from our SCBA, you know, walk through, and we're pulling ceilings down. There's so much stuff that lingers in there that have so many year long effects that your body's absorbing it. And then, you know, with, with the fire community, you know, we have all our gear on and we're protected but we're sweating, right? You know, we're carrying a bunch of stuff. We're sweating, we're working. Well, all of the, all of that, those carcinogens, let's just say hypothetically in this, I'm going to call it a living room just for lack of a better term. All of that smoke and particles will hit our hood that covers our neck and our ears and stuff, our armpits, our groin. So like the biggest cause of cancer for firemen right now is throat cancer, lung cancer, testicular cancer and it's all where stuff is pushing on us so it's act we're actually absorbing all of that into our skin so like we've gotten better currently as getting a quick you know dirty decon is what we call it getting sprayed off with water get all but get all your gear off doesn't go back in the truck like in the passenger compartment we'll put it in a different compartment take it home wash it first thing is we shower get all of that stuff off but yeah, you're right. I mean, all of those lingering things. So like these police officers, let's just say, you know, they made entry for a little bit. They're getting all of that. They're breathing it in, but they're also absorbing it. Mm. And, and that's that. I mean, that's we've gotten much better with our cancer awareness because all of our brothers have been passing away. And we're, you know, science is showing. Yeah. We got to fix we, it. We, we, like we, we give we give firefighters so much shit over like, oh, Jesus Christ, they get, you know, two physicals a year and they get this. But <laughs> People don't, you know, like for what sleeping, you know, 23 of the 24 hours of their shift or whatever. But this is, you know, I I used to liken that to the detective unit I was in. We weren't busy until we were busy. Then we were fucking busy. Right. So uh, this is the same thing. The hazards of that job are, are exponential. Like people just don't realize that 
even in a, a brand new car, the, the brand new car is even worse. Like w- w- we had a discussion in Clayton about uh, a Tesla, like the dangers of a Tesla catching on fire, t- 10 times worse than, than a, than a Vega from 1979, like John drives. Like <laughs> what, what, what is the, you know, like, so what is it about a, a Tesla that, that would be a, a, a hazard to you? I've got all kinds of Tesla information for you. If you drive a Tesla, first of all, you're in a death trap. Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> so uh, hypothetically, we get dispatched to a Tesla car fire, and we we have all kinds. We we got a bunch of books, you know, guidelines in our trucks, you know, because you know there's a bunch of different ones. You know, the Chevy oh, Volt Tesla of where if somebody's trapped, where can we cut? Where is what? You know, where's the main battery line going to? Where if we cut through that frame, we're going to get shocked. But it, it, one catching on fire. I mean, it takes uh, the studies have shown it takes like over forty thousand gallons of water to put it out. Well, those things will but burn underwater. Not, I mean, but it's still not going out because okay, we're good. We leave. It goes on a tow truck and catch it because the the batteries will reignite. So you have to pull in, you know, foam, you know, foam applications, you know, with the water. And I mean, there's there I I have yet to deal with one, and I don't want to, but they sound like a freaking nightmare. <laughs> Well, hey, you I, mentioned people getting trapped. I mean, we had to have a whole briefing on this because if the power goes out after some kind of collision or something and the battery's damaged and you yeah, start how are they going to get out? They can't get out. Where this is the escape handle, okay? So, first of all, they're freaking out. They're going to be going like this. Now, you can't see me at home, but I'm grabbing to the left. You know, if you're in the driver's side door, you're going to be going for a handle because that's where you go to get out. But the escape handle on a Tesla is like a ripcord. Like you have to pull like a parachute. It's under your driver's seat. So imagine this person screaming. There's flames, there's smoke. There's a terrible smell from this car. They can't get out. And once you're trapped, like all of your rational thinking and all of your listening skills yes. disappear. And so you're a dispatcher and let's say you're me and you just happen to know, like, listen, the escape handle is under the seat, reach under the seat and pull the handle. It's kind of like the handle that's inside your trunk that helps you escape the trunk. Why the hell is the escape handle under there? You need the escape right. handle on the door. You need, you just need a regular latch to get out of that thing. I had a and, Tesla Uber and I couldn't even get into it because I had no <laughs> idea how the door handles worked. So. But that, and not only that, but like, you know, if, if smoke's coming from the vehicle, now, you you know, we addressed this earlier with the hydrogen cyanide, but that gas will, can blind you. It can, if it doesn't kill you, it'll like damage, it'll se- severely curtail your lifespan just by breathing yeah. in the smoke. When you take one breath and, and your breath's gone, and then when you can't breathe, what do you do? You freak out. Oh, same yeah. thing. Held yeah. underwater, guess what? You start flailing, right? I yes. mean, it's the same thing. And but anyway, these Teslas are all more oxygen. Yeah, yeah. And the Teslas are all over. And these things, I mean, it. <laughs> You know what? How long? Is, how much money is it going to take, or lawsuits before these things like are recalled or whatever? Because I'm serious when I say they're death traps. So they either need to get ra- massively re-engineered for safety purposes, or I'm, to be honest with you, I'm just not a big fan of the Teslas. Okay, because you know we talk about the environment and we don't want oil and gasoline and all this, but we have no idea what the end of life for these cars is when we have like basically you know two tons of chemicals that we can't recycle, can't get rid of safely. So we're going to have a big pit outside of town that has all these, you know, destroyed or outdated or crushed Teslas in them. And they're just going to leach into the earth and do what else. So thanks, guys. Thanks to the environmental guys, first of all, for bringing well, all these chemicals and the precious metals out of Africa. Nadugu has to dig them out of a mine. Drew, go ahead. Uh, God bless you. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, ask on behalf of all the environmental friends, uh, Jason, if you could kind of keep the water to a minimum when you're trying to put one of these tesla's out because we got to conserve water first of all i would i would do my best if you wouldn't mind uh how dare you not conserve water uh and i know that that is uh carol's uh favorite carol (laughs) Uh, so yeah i I, so i wanted to get into that a little bit you'll you'll hear in a second uh some banter back and forth about the actual flame so let's play a little more of it I don't think we can go inside with this smoke. Cover me. Who's covering? Who's covering? I got I got you. We got you.
get some details of who else is in, inside. I He was armed with a 9 millimeter handgun. He was carrying a total of 23 fully loaded handgun magazines. They're showing 19 of them here. He was also found in possession of a 12 gauge shotgun. They're showing a picture of that. Um, and uh, of, uh, over 150 shotgun shells in his possession. So that was what was in the bag as well. They show uh, the first officer's uh, arrival. He, he kind of took cover behind a mailbox, but he was still shot up pretty well, like the, the, the vehicle was, not the officer, thank God. Um, and then uh, so that's kind of how everything ends with that uh, particular segment that we have but um did you see anything else like with the flame shooting out the window chief that uh anybody should be aware of or is this just like the normal progression of a of a fire well i was curious and i don't, I don't know if i don't know if dead can pull that the picture up of the the aerial view of the house because i was curious that's what i was leaning in trying to look at i mean it, it's a very odd shaped or odd structured house i mean it's nothing that you know we have where typically where where i'm at but uh <laughs> Hey, anyway, if you can, it's not a big deal. It's, you know, obviously part of the roof collapsed in. I don't know what the fire uh, tactics were, you know, when they, when they got there. I did a little bit, of, you know, a little bit of research on the fire department that covers that. Uh, it looks like they have nine, nine people on duty, you know, two people on a medic unit, possibly four. And then obviously they're called in mutual aid. I mean, whenever a structure fire comes out, at, at least where I'm where I'm from, we get mutual aid units coming. Yeah. So you have enough people there, but I don't know how far developed that fire got before they showed up. Yeah, you know, while you know while those police officers were standing at the door. Right. Um, I do know that it, the house was eventually a total there loss. There's a GoFundMe right now because this poor uh, widow, you know, uh, she not only has the death of her husband, but she's lost all her earthly possessions. I believe the house yeah. was a total loss. So, I mean, it looks like, I mean, it's, I mean, honestly, I would call that almost like a one and a half story, but looking yeah. at the, the roof collapse, you know, where it burned through, you know, it went up through that living room, probably shot up a stairwell, you know, up into a, you know, a loft or, you know, almost, I mean, it's not a Cape Cod. I, I know that, but it, it, it's a, it's a weird looking house. Yeah, so. it's, got, it's got that gable. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I could see what you're saying. Like in that front room. It, it, probably when you walk into that house, there's a staircase like pretty close to the front entrance, right? Yeah, so probably you, right. You think, door. yeah, like you you think that maybe he set that front room on fire, and then the the flames or whatever traveled straight up the yeah. stairs, and just, so you can just see like the a, back, yeah, just like a chimney. Yeah, so the back part of the house is just like the roof is just obliterated, like it's just completely. And without knowing the time gone. frames, just to see, I'd be curious and. and Maybe I'll do a public records request because now I'm now I'm intrigued and interested. But you know, just to figure out the time frame to lose a roof like that. I mean, if if the cops are there and they, you know, instead of somebody calling nine one one, they've got the radio, so they're going right to dispatch. So hey, we've got a working fire. Those guys are going to be coming pretty quick, you know, versus getting all the questions just like the police dispatcher got from you know the original gunshot call. They don't have to go through all of those preliminary questions that you guys are trying yeah. to ask hey right. we got a fire. they're there, they're there. we got a fire so let's go here's uh something that's kind of impressive to me though Th these officers took rounds they had to use deadly force and now they're dealing with a, a live victim somewhere but they're also <laughs> trying to control their breathing from the the trauma of the deadly force that they just had to use and now they're dealing with a structure fire, like a, a full-on structure fire, and they don't know what's inside or who else is in there. They think that they got the shooter. And did she blah, get blah, out? I, I didn't read yeah. it. I didn't, she, she, she was uh, already out. I, I, right. I, the only reason I say that is because I think at one point somebody says, "Yeah, go over there and deal with her." So okay. I, I don't, okay. I, and I don't know if they were referring to a neighbor or what, but I, I know that uh, she did. Um, she did. Uh, make it out uh, or, or at some point you made it out listen we've got b trav we've got brian travis calling in so i'm going to go to him hopefully we can get some details here maybe not can you hear me brian brian are you on the line hey brian yeah i'm here can you guys hear me oh yeah can you hear me 
I can. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's going on, man? Hey, uh, no, I just wanted to call in. Um, it, super weird when I heard that voice. I was like, I know that that person. Um, and then I remembered you said it was Ogden, and so I kind of just did some quick math. You know, it turns out two and two, and I'm like, holy shit, that's, that's definitely my brother. <laughs> um, I, I reached out to him. He did, uh, I did tell him, you know, he did a fantastic job. Uh, encouraged the, him to at least check the show out. But, uh, but I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm super proud of him, and I can just tell, you know, just from that, just from the call itself, um, you know, he, he did a great job. He was super calm. He got as much information as he needed. Um, yeah. Has he always been that way? Has super, he always, super weird to hear. Has he always been the voice of reason? Uh, has, has he always been the Yeah, he's voice? usually pretty laid back. <laughs> yeah. That's great. He's uh he's two years my senior and he and he doesn't uh he doesn't really get flustered super easy. He's always laid back and yeah. It's kind of been his, his nature growing up and as he got older. What a small world. Well, I appreciate you calling, checking on him. Hopefully the two of you, uh, and Michael will appreciate this, hopefully the two of you have an Aunt Sally, and you will recruit her to watch this as well. Uh, but, you know, send our congratulations. We will send a digital bookmark his way uh, for his participation in this uh, this thing tonight. And in all seriousness, he did a fantastic job. That was a very traumatic uh, thing, and and I'm sure that, uh, you know, he, he probably echoed the same things we did. He, he, sometimes you just know when you got a live one on the phone and he, uh, he handled it like a true professional. So hats off to him. Brian, thanks for calling in. Yeah. Appreciate it, John. Uh, thanks again for everything you guys do and, uh, keep up the good work. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Well, here's what we're going to do though. Uh, we're going to play the actual news clip to kind of backfill you on the whole thing uh just to kind of summarize everything that would that happened this is from um uh, i A can't remember the channel scene. this is from law and crime so um just hear it out this is uh this is how everything Utah, went down when a heavily armed suspect dies during a police shootout all this after he drove 12 hours shot and killed his brother and set his house on fire <laughs> I... The deadly shooting happened on April 27th in North Ogden, Utah. Officials there say 66-year-old Jeffrey Roberts drove from Long Beach, California to the home of his brother, Scott Roberts. Ring doorbell video captures Jeffrey Roberts approaching his brother's front door. <laughs> At first, the conversation seems relatively normal. Hey, what's up? What are you doing? Don't <laughs> guess we came by the same mall. She's not here? Where's she at? In Missouri? What's she doing there? Well, she's living with Lorinda's mom, who's taking care of her. Really? Yeah. Well, how long has she been there? Uh, about a year. But suddenly, Roberts reaches for his pocket. After that, he opens fire. Really? Hearing the gunshots, nearby neighbors call 911. It was next door and it sounded like gunshots, but I'm not sure about that. But The caller reports that an unknown male is in his neighborhood. And there was a guy that walked out of the house, but I couldn't tell. Like I said, it was pretty loud, but you it sounded like... Was it a male or...? A male. In a brown van. Do you know if that male lives there or? No. No, I've, I've never seen a van, but it looks like it's a work van, so I don't know. That's what I'm saying now. I'm questioning myself, but it sounded like gunshot. Before police arrive on the scene, ring video captures Roberts going in and out of the house. He appears to be talking on the phone during this time. <laughs> At one point, Roberts is caught on video with a weapon in his hand. Investigators later confirmed Roberts was armed with a 9mm handgun, 
a 12 gauge shotgun, 23 fully loaded handgun magazines, and 150 shotgun shells. Roberts can also be heard referencing his bank account. To uh, give it to Julie. Gang, it's my turn. Everything else. During this time, investigators say Roberts used road flares to start his brother's house on fire. As police arrive on the scene, Roberts begins firing. As they return fire, the incident is caught on ring video. Three officers opened fire on the scene, but only one activated their body camera in time. This is video of the officers arriving on the scene. Jeffrey Roberts was shot and killed as gunfire was exchanged. After that, officers approach, working to secure the scene. Stand by, stand by. I don't see his gun. Hey, how many? Guns on the floor, guns on the floor. He's down. He's Headshot down. window. Meanwhile, first responders notice the growing flames inside the home. There's a fire inside the house. I don't think we can go inside with this smoke. Cover me. Who's covering? Who's covering? I got I got you. We got you. I Police later confirmed Roberts shot both his brother Scott Roberts and his sister-in-law Jody Roberts. Scott was killed while Jody is currently recovering at the hospital. Female says she was shot. <coughs> Where's she at? Go deal with her. Right now, the shooting is still under investigation. Once complete, the final report will be sent to the Weber County Attorney's Office. We don't know what happened to the to the dog. Uh, there's several questions about the dog. Um, they, it is. They usually get out first. Some, something, uh, yeah, they sense danger, I'm sure. There's something uh, that tells me now, because uh, we had a little private chat, um, uh, Chief Keefe and I did, uh, perhaps in the crossfire is when the windows were broken out. Uh, you know, you know, Jason posited that it could have been the heat that blew the window out. Um, so either way. Um, but at any rate, any final words on what we did, uh, what the response was? Uh, I, oh, I do have something, so just remind me. Uh, John, you go first, I guess. No, uh, just good job to the police officers there. You know, uh, unfortunately, the man was uh, killed by his brother. Uh, his, uh, his daughter says, you know, that my mom's alive today because my, my father fought my uncle. He took rounds and he told my mother to run. And I guess uh, just struggling with his brother and doing that allowed uh, mom to get away. Obviously, she's going through a terrible time. Uh, the turmoil in this family just must be unbearable. But uh, uh, just we're glad that, uh, you know, the man fought for his family and saved his wife. And um, yeah, it's just really rough. And, you know, once again, another worthy cause. You know, we encourage you to do your own checking and, you know, vet these things. But if you feel like supporting that family, I encourage you to look into that. And good job to the officers who put it into this quickly. They were able to uh, do it that what was necessary. Obviously, this guy was dangerous. He had already killed one and he was ready to kill more. He's ready to kill lots more. And uh, this is uh, where that good marksmanship from uh, a police officer, but just uh, a good guy with a gun could come in and put down. Uh, someone who's really ready to do a lot of damage. And it doesn't always have to be a police officer to do that, just since we opened up the show talking about, uh, you know, what guns mean in our society. But here we have a police officer who's acting quickly and bravely and with great professionalism to neutralize a threat. Thanks, Drew. What do you do, uh, Chief Keefe, uh, you as the firefighter to kind of, you know, going into it, you maybe you get a briefing from the officers as you're walking up to the scene or running up or whatever. Uh, uh, how 
are are you able to preserve any evidence whatsoever? Like, do you do you take extra precaution in doing any of that? And that's and I was yeah I was going to hit that because you know coming into something like that that's already a crime scene before you know we've even started to work. You know, a lot of times you know these arson cases like that Robert Fisher case that I presented. It's you you don't know it's a crime scene. We know it is going in, and that's why I was asking like whether whether the the wife made it out or not, and whether the the firefighters pulled her out or, but yeah, there's definitely a little bit more care. I mean, we still have a job to do as well. Yeah. You know, we try to save the house, preserve property as best we can. Um, but also understanding that the police officers have a job to do. This is a crime scene and you have to preserve evidence. Now you go into that house and start spraying water. Everything's going to go awry. I mean, you're, you're, <laughs> whether it's shell casings or, or whatever it may be, it's, I mean, it's going to be chaos. But as as soon as the fire's out, we deem it's not, you know, a hazard anymore. We would back everybody out and nobody else goes in. Maybe the you know, the officer of the truck, you know, whoever the 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 highest ranking officer on the on the scene may be involved with the police. But going in and trying to fight that fire and, and looking at that roof collapse, I mean, it it had to have escalated. I mean, I did see some some video of somebody driving by and there was a shit ton of smoke. So I'm sure they had their work cut out for them. But yeah, as soon as it's done, you leave everything where it sits, let the investigation go on, you know, that you guys do. We'll pick our stuff up later. But yeah, I mean, it's not so, the, not on the forefront of, I mean, we try to preserve evidence anyway, but. So just a, to, just to clarify, you know, in a situation like this, okay, we've obviously, you know, had a murder, a weapons violation. We have an assault, an officer involved shooting. But in terms of incident command, because of the fire, you know, the police essentially turn over command of the incident to you. And that, you know, the crime scene is obviously a crime scene, but it, from an incident command standpoint, you're in charge of that until it's safe to go back inside. Is that correct? Correct. I mean, typically, at least the way it is in Ohio, we own the scene until we turn it over to the police. Problem is you get in it. And something I've been preaching about, you know, for the, the latter part of my career is the incident command structure is, is so difficult because police and fire don't talk and we need to come up with a, we all go through ICS, NIMS and all that stuff, but we never really communicate. Active shooters are, are a perfect example. Cops are doing their thing, fire's doing theirs. This one's a very small, you know, isolated incident. So I'm sure whoever the sergeant or cur uh, lieutenant, whoever was on scene covering it was talking to the fire chief, system fire chief, whatever. This one's small, but, but yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a big problem that we have in the public sector anyway. So NIMS came about, it's the National uh, Incident Management System, if I'm correct. Basically, there were these big fires out in California, and they, they found that the Forestry Service and the firefighters basically for, had poor command structure where you would have one person who was responding, had too many people under his charge. Correct. You didn't know who was in charge of what. We didn't, we didn't have agencies talking to each other using the same language, almost like the 9-11 thing. So what NIMS is is actually a joint command where you have people of in equal rank who collaborate and share command and then disseminate commands to the various chains. So you have a, you would have essentially a fire chief or the head firefighter on scene, and then your head police officer would be in a joint right. command. And I know and, that's easy to say. We know NIMS. We've done NIMS. We've done the right. tests. No, but then when you're easy. there and you, when, when you're there and there's smoke and there's blood and everyone's amped up, like the whole uh, incident command system thing quickly gets out of hand. Is that right? And it, it started with the wildland, and, and I agree with you, and then it, it became mandatory after 9-11. Mm, right. Okay. Yeah. But it, it's still, it's still difficult to do. And and to be honest, yeah. ICS incident command system, it's something that we still struggle with every day because uh, you know, you'll get somebody there and police officers in particular are often possessed by rank and they, you know, you'll have an, an officer there who's in charge of the incident simply because they're the first one there. And they're, you know, like last week at the at the bank, and then and then a sergeant shows up, and then they just kind of shrug their soldiers and shoulders and look at Sarge, and Sarge is like, "Well, yeah, I just got here. I don't know what the hell is going on." Right. And that officer's still in command, but it it feels it feels weird sometimes the way incident command systems work, and it's that's why you have to train on it, and you have to actually know what you're doing, and it is important from a dispatch point of view because if you have all these different people who are communicating with the dispatch agency and we have no idea who's actually in charge, sometimes we get conflicting things. Like we'll have an incident in a town. We'll have two things going on and we have an incident commander over here and an incident commander over here asking for the same resource. And it very quickly can become, 
uh, very confusing and, and hectic where you have two uh, essentially incidents where they're of equal rank asking for the same resource or whatever you, else. And you guys are typically monitoring two different channels because you have a yeah. fire channel, police channel. So two minimum. Yeah. But so I don't know. Yeah. At, yeah. At minimum. I don't know what the police are doing on my fire channel because I'm listening to that. I have no idea what they're doing. And I, I don't know what the right answer is. I mean, I think we're every day trying to attempt to find that. But what you know, what I would suggest is that uh, we basically go over to a, another channel, a tactical channel or special operations channel where you would change your channel and the police would change their channel to just basically an incident channel. Or at least a few people, the, the people that need to know it. You're, you're on this channel and then you, you disseminate that on with another that radio how, on the other channel. Yeah, that's one, how we one, practiced it. One thing, and I, I don't want to give you a pro tip because maybe you already do this, but just a dispatcher would appreciate this, that whether you're on a fire truck or whether you're an incident command, uh, make one person your communications person. And it can be you if you want to, if you're the incident commander. But what's really frustrating for dispatchers is when we have a whole bunch of firefighters talking to us because because you can have a lot of firefighters at the scene and it can be confusing who's who's talking and not all firefighters will are, are good about using their specific radio handles or whatever Correct. so i would i would just recommend having one person that's your communication person to dispatch i'm, I'm sure it's the same in the police world and and then i'll stop talking but you know we always call it we have too many chiefs not enough indians yeah you, you, you have too many people that want to hear themselves on the radio yeah it's that that does happen yes uh, we're going to get to the uh, voicemails uh, before we wrap this up. Uh, I do want to mention one thing. The the news uh, story that you just saw from Law and Crime Network, I think it is. Um, I, I appreciate their content, too. They do a lot of good stuff. Um, she mentioned that the body camera did not activate on one or two of the officers. Um, luckily, it did activate on one of them. Just so you'll know, there is a feature or a function, and it depends on what level uh, or what package you buy, by the way, from Axon or whatever company you're using to, to pr provide you with your webcams, but uh, your body cams. You, if your gun comes out of your holster, your camera pops on, and it rewinds 30 seconds. So that's why a lot of times people won't even activate their body cameras. They'll just jump out of the car, take their gun out of their holster, and you'll see the first 30 seconds of non of no audio. That's what that first 30 seconds is. It's, yeah. it's, it's actually just a, a, a buffer of the previous 30 seconds, which makes things uneasy for somebody who carries a body, you know, somebody wearing a body camera because uh, who knows what you were doing in the previous 30 seconds. It, it's also can, can supposed I say to one more, one more thing, one more real quick thing. The body one more camera. than you're out of here. One more, one more than I'm out of here as long as you keep me. But with, with the body cameras, like I'm an arson, an arson as an arson investigator, like that, that is huge because I'm seeing before I even get there. Once I get that that footage, I'm seeing exactly. All right, so I have a room of origin. So like it, it is so, and how some departments don't have it, and I understand finance, you know, financial stuff. You know, that's a whole nother topic. But that body camera footage for me as an arson investigator, I know exactly where I'm going right out of the gate. Before, you know, after the fact, after we put the fire out, I look at that. I know exactly where I'm going to look. So it's, it helps cops. It helps firemen, you know, all, all of that stuff. So that's all I got. Sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. Great point. Good, I just wanted point. to make sure that um, not all body cams are built the same and not all activation features are the same. Sometimes you know when when you open your back door on a patrol car the body cam will activate because you know generally that's when you're getting a prisoner in or out and it doesn't matter if you forget or you don't it's going to automatically activate and by the way what will happen is everybody within your circumference if you're you know if you're within five or ten feet of uh, somebody whose body cam activates everybody else's body camera activates uh, and that becomes quite a hassle when you're just opening a back door to, to grab a paper clip out of the, out of your, uh, you know, whatever. So, um, but not all, uh, not all body cameras have that same feature. John, I want to listen. I want to play these voicemails. I know that you keep telling me that I'm, I shouldn't, but I'm good. I do have, I have, I do have one thing. I actually, I got a message three weeks ago and I promised. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it. go for it. It, he said it was too long for a voicemail, which I guess I appreciate because sometimes I'm piecing together multiple voicemails. You know, our system only let, lets you go up to two minutes. So I'll, I'll read this. He just wants to talk about this. I think this was um, this one. He sent this to us, I think, uh, after the 
you know, the Las Vegas one where we put them in the back of the car and you don't Mirandize them and they start talking and they say something incriminating, you know, a spontaneous yeah. statement against interest or whatever. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and read it. So you and Drew both talked about when you have someone who is under arrest and you're transporting them to the jail or back to the station for an interview and they just spontaneously start talking. Similar situation happened to me about two years ago. I was just a few months off training and working as a solo deputy in my assigned beat. The typical neighbor dispute call is assigned to me and I start going to the call or I start, and I start by calling the reporting party to gather more information. While on the phone, he tells me the neighbor down the road was yelling and cursing at him while he walked by the neighbor's house to, to get to his. While on the phone, I hear my reporting party say, oh shit, he's got a gun, followed by a couple of shots and my reporting party running down the road back to his house. He says he was hit in the leg, so I stage medical and tell him to stay put. What was not shared by my reporting party is the fact that he, just 19 years old, beat the living crap out of the older neighbor who was in his 60s several months prior. We respond code and meet the victim as he's being driven out by his mother and girlfriend. We called out the older guy and detained him without incident. While he was sitting in the back of my car and I was babysitting him as the other deputies did a sweep of his residence, he basically confessed to shooting a couple warning shots in the air and said, said he put one in the ground. All said unprovoked and, and recorded inside my car. It turns out he saw the kid walking down the road and the kid was talking shit. So the old guy says to himself, he's not going to get beat up again. And he grabs his pistol from inside the house. The warning shot in the ground caught the kid's shin on a ricochet. He basically confessed to doing all that because he was making small talk and letting him ramble on while he was in my car. That's uh, that's kind of a cool story of uh, you know a time where you have have a suspect in the car and they just start just start talking. It's been driving me nuts lately because we've got some brand new deputies who they'll arrive on scene and they get contact with the suspect and then I don't know why they're doing this, but they immediately radio me and like uh, just uh, if you could note that we uh, gave him his Miranda, you know, and I'm just like. Maybe you just want to just let it get there and just like say hi, I'm a policeman, and maybe just let him talk for a little bit. I don't know, Drew. What do you think about that? Well, it, there it, there is a fine line, and there is no app that's going to go off on your phone when when it's time to Mirandize somebody. But it's it's custody and uh, interrogation which triggers the Miranda. So if they're not in custody, if they're free to leave, you can ask them anything you want. If they are in custody and you ask them, you start asking them guilt seeking questions then you're going to need to Mirandize them. And right. then, of course, they have to demonstrate that they understand their their waiver and they have to give a clear uh, waiver. They have to say, yes, I'm waiving my rights. So uh, there is nothing wrong with small talk and there is nothing wrong with Mirandizing somebody and engaging in small talk. As long as you're not a listening or, or, or engaging in behavior that would elicit some type of confession, um, you can talk about baseball. And if they were like, man, yeah, I, I uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, that Vladimir Guerrero kid can really hit the ball like, you know, I hit that dude in the head equally as hard. It's fair game. Uh, they they came off at that. You were just making small talk about baseball, and he he starts to, you know going into about how hard he hit the guy that, uh, you know, I had an incident in my car one time. Uh, the guy was he invoked his Miranda rights. He didn't want to talk, but um, I was writing in my affidavit. I, I wrote something, and and he told me. Uh, it, it, he just started saying how, about how it felt good to get all his aggression out. He said the guy felt weak beneath his hand. I, I'll never forget that phraseology, but he said he felt weak beneath his hands and it went right in the affidavit that that's what he said he did. He basically confessed without me asking for a confession. Um, I want to get to, uh, we, we could do a whole episode on, um, on interviews and interrogations, but uh, I would save that for the big show, John. Uh, oh, come on. Chief. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Keith, I can't thank you enough for coming. I, we're going to play uh, out some voicemails, and uh, I, we thank you all for joining. We'll come back in a second, but let's listen to some of our voicemails. If you want to leave us a voicemail, uh, do, get us at uh, 848-266-6911, 848-COM-911. Nice. nice. Oh, what happened? Play them wonderful well, voice. Well, boys, it's the OG Canada correspondent. Yeah. Uh, I've been gone because I almost got permanently 10 7 canoed. Who figured after getting blown up and shot at that a mold infection would be the thing that almost takes me out? All I got to say is 
I would have rather Tampa win over Toronto as well because there's nothing more than any other Canadian would rather do than have Toronto lose rather than hear people from Toronto talk about how they won something all goddamn year. That and the CFL draft is a joke because most of those guys are dentists in the offseason because it doesn't pay nothing. Anyway, hopefully we're not 10-7 canoe again. We'll talk to you later. Hey, John and Drew. It's Andrew from the Midwest. John, I want you to know the beard is looking fantastic. Don't change anything. Keep doing what you're doing. Concur. <laughs> so I know last week's story was kind of heavy, was kind of intense, so I figured you guys could use something a little bit funnier and a little bit great to laugh at. So coming from a former corrections officer, I have a story. About six months after I got trained in our segregation unit, our high security, high security isolation cells, uh, I was up working, and it was lunchtime. And this was back when we used to serve hot dogs for lunch on occasion, about twice a month. And these were not just regular hot dogs. They were big old fat Polish sausage, Polish sausage looking things. And we had one, one, one gentleman who uh, was very, very openly homosexual and liked to do dirty things. Now, I promise yeah, you, I, I, did not, I, I, I promise you, I did not edit that. That's exactly where it cut off. John, do you have an opinion on how that cut off? I think the think the internet probably censored the rest of that, or like maybe (laughs) he was reliving it and he PTSD'd himself into a coma. I wanted to say to all the correctional officers out there, happy National Correctional Officer Week. We know that you are protecting the community by keeping those guys inside the walls. That it is not the fence that does that, that it is you. We appreciate you guys. Uh, Because it's National Correctional Week, and not just because it was coincidental and I happened to notice after the fact, Abby Ellsworth and me from on being a police officer have been reading, have been releasing episode after episode after episode (laughs) this week on Patreon of failure to stop hard time, which is an edition of this show. That's a little bit less professional, a little bit less well-recognized, a little bit less (laughs) well-known. So it's just perfect for correctional officers. And we talk about prison shit and it's just for you because no one else can understand. It's like even more esoteric than police stuff because the people at least like police. There's at least shows about police officers. At least you could watch Law and Order. But for correctional officers, you get like some sort of A&E special that just shows uh, how terrible correctional officers are. But I know you guys are great. And because I am under threat of death, I also must note that it is also... National Nurse Appreciation Week. So if you are a nurse, we appreciate all you're doing. You're kind of a first responder. You're in there. Andrea may or may not be a nurse. Andrea, we appreciate you and the medical expertise you bring to the show. Thanks for being a nurse. Also, I want to say one last thing, that if you are a nurse and you work in prison, double week for you. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Man, that's good. You get a double. Uh, this n- n- Hopefully on the next episode with uh, John and Abby, uh, Abby's going to create a shiv. In, uh, in, in staff uh, we're, that actually One, that's what we're doing it's we our next episode is just how to make shivs what makes a good shiv when okay. to shiv uh where to right. keep your shiv antique yeah. shivs the history of shivs you know toothbrush all shivs. That stuff. yeah yes. hold on I, I got one more voicemail to play and it's very personal to john hey john um i have my son here who has a message for you um what do you what do you have You're to the say? best youtuber ever i feel bad for you I, I want people to give you lots of like. So, please make it better videos than just talk. All right. I hope you take that advice to heart. Okay. That okay. appears to be somebody who has a young child in captivity. But, uh, <laughs> John, they want you to uh, make more um you know, YouTube's. I, back before you were born, I actually had a YouTube channel and it was great. <laughs> and then I got I got hired by cops. And then like, you know, you have to be like more professional with your social media life. So that's you got to dumb it away. down. But, but I, I know that you probably want me to play video games. I'm ha- I'll start playing Super Mario Brothers 3 for you any day now. And uh, we'll have you on the show in June. There's a week where Drew's taking off. We'll have you come on to do the police perspective so you can see how fun and hard it is to make a video. The little kid thinks is not interesting. <laughs> That reminds me, Gromit Vomit exists. Go watch some fun kids do some skateboarding stuff. Uh, they're, they're the show for you. And I'm sorry I've let you down, little boy. I apologize. Okay. Uh, on behalf of uh, Chief Keefe and all of the One More and I'm Out of Here podcast crew, myself and John, who is the most mediocre YouTuber, I'm Drew Breezy. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, John and Chief, Stick around, please. Stick around.